Happy to have with us here at ASCO 2013 the rare tumor or sarcoma doctor from Washington University in St. Louis, Brian Van Tyne, MD and PhD, and he's here to talk about molecular profiling. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. So you're not saying you are the rare tumor doctor, the only one. You are a doctor who works with rare tumors. I, I work with tumors where the majority of cases, 13,000 that happen a year, are divided amongst a very special select group of doctors that really focus on tumors where the genetics are complicated, the genetics are rare, and these events happen so rarely that when you go to treat them, there's not a lot of evidence in the first place, and so you start looking for other ways of bringing in information about your patients. And so one of the things that we found is that with the advent of all the new technologies and sequencing and molecular profiling, you can start to actually take a lot of the drugs that we do know and do already have and identify which drugs you can give to what patient. Because if you have a tumor that 20 people get a year, there's no phase three data that actually allows you to know what to do. But then if you can start identifying mutations or proteins that can be expressed in drugs, you may be able to build a therapeutic program that can be used to actually treat a patient and treat them successfully. So how is your timetable compared to other areas of cancer care? Has it been a good year, if you will, for molecular profiling? So one of the best things that's happened this year to rare tumors is the TCGA, which is the genomic sequencing project that's run through the, uh, the, the, the NIH, has actually chosen to start sequencing some of the rare tumors as a group to see if we can actually figure out how these work. And so this has been a nice step forward for the rare tumor uh, doctors that exist. And at the same time, some of the molecular profiling uh, companies have started to realize that we actually have a group of patients that truly need these type of services so that you can actually really figure out what to do or maybe what not to do for patients because in the rare tumor world the one size fits all give every you know patient adriamycin may not be the right thing to do. Your colleague Dr. Von Hoff is presenting data here at ASCO. Can you tell us about the importance of it? So one of the neat things about Keras is they have a uh, huge database now, about 35,000 cases, and they've gone through them and looked at biomarkers and sequencing, and they're finding that, uh, you know, the traditional classes of mutations, say, uh, mutations in CKIT, which were tra traditionally seen in CML and GIST, are now being found in uveal melanoma and other places where they don't belong, and they actually may have therapeutic implications. And, you know, you look and you find MGMT expression changes in various tumors, which may uh, start to suggest who you used to carbazine with, uh, you know, the estrogen patterns change. You know, there's a new point mutation that uh, in HER2, which is an activated mutation, which actually changes the paradigm for HER2. So there is a single point mutation that was found by the Ellis Group at Washington University in St. Louis, which identified uh, a change where it's not fish amplified, it's not overexpressed, but it's a thousand times more active. And you find that by genomic sequencing. And that's a, you know, a mutation where ER positive breast cancer, patients who wouldn't have gotten Herceptin now seem to respond to Lapatinib. And these ideas become really important because as you really get into rare tumors, finding these same events which are going to happen over and over and over again, which is what Dr. Van Hoff began to show, means that we can translate potentially from treating cancer as, instead of breast, colon, lung, et cetera, and all the subdivisions below it, more moving towards a biologically based pathways. So these pathways as, opposed, uh, as applied to breast cancer, these pathways as opposed to colon cancer and when in my world these pathways is, is really a, you know implanted over various versions of sarcoma some of which don't respond to chemotherapy at all but still kill our patients just as quickly. What do you see as the future of molecular profiling as you sit here in 2013? I think one of the neat things that's going to come out of molecular profiling as a whole is that we're going to be able to get away from actually, everybody's been trying to find the right drug to give to the right patient. One of the things I think profiling is starting to teach us is that we can start not giving certain drugs. It's going to improve the cost effectiveness uh, to the system, and at the same time, we're going to start to be able to avoid giving our patients a lot of toxicity that they don't need because they're not going to benefit from it. And I think the most important thing that's going to change and that's going to come out in, from the profiling world is actually teaching people what not to use. Because if I didn't give you a drug that you weren't going to benefit from, I might be able to actually give you a better frontline therapy. Because once we start treating you with chemotherapy, we change your tumor.
And what grows out, even if it didn't respond, may be altered. And we may get away from a pathway that we could have drugged just by changing the underlying genetics of a tumor through damage that it survives. So figuring out what not to do is really kind of these new ideas coming out and profiling that I think may really change practice. And in, in the bigger picture, may actually save us a lot of money. How important is this on the road to personalized medicine, the, where everybody wants to get to? I, I think that really the idea is of figuring out what to use and what not to use. And finding that patient, you know, that one in a thousand patient that should get something that you wouldn't give them in the first place, really is going to change us. And I think that the information put together where we take all the science that's been done since the 60s and the 70s and everything we know about biomarkers put together with everything we know about pathways, we, you know, this is, this is a neat generation to practice oncology in because all of a sudden you're able to move this forward and the scientists aren't locked in one building and the clinicians in another. But what now you have is a coming together of everything that we've been working for for so long, which is our understanding of pathways, our finding of proteins and our ability to drug it, because as the more drugs come out and as more drugs are available, it's really going to change why we're going to need profiling to identify what goes with whom. It sounds like a great approach for progress. <laughs> no, I think this is the most excellent approach for progress, and as it gets more complicated, I think we're going to have to find more bioinformatic-driven treatment response plans, because to actually understand every pathway, we're all either going to have to spend more years in basic science grad school, making sure we understand how each pathway at each step works, or we're going to have to start relying more on uh, computational-driven means to actually identify how to treat patients. Very good. Thanks for joining us. Come back and see us again, would you? Thank you so much. All right. Dr. Brian Van Tyne from Washington University in St. Louis talking about the progress and the promise of molecular profiling.